Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the show where we shine a microscope on the mysteries swirling in your gut and connect them to the quirks of your mind. I'm Ethan Foster, your friendly observer of oddities everywhere. And I'm Alara Skye, your resident comedic tactician who can't resist turning complicated scientific insights into entertaining dinner conversation. Today, we're talking about gut health's impact on mental well-being. Yes, your beloved gut flora is apparently influencing whether you feel like dancing through life or hiding under a blanket. You see, I knew my stomach was controlling me when it started demanding pizza at 3 a.m., but it turns out there's a name for some of the troublemakers in there, something a bit more scientific than pizza gremlin. Are you referring to Morganella Morgani? Because if that bacterium had a theme song, it would be, I'm Morganella, and I'm messing with your mind. Of course, no actual theme music needed. Our show is purely dialogue. For those who haven't heard of Morganella Morgani, it's a gut bacterium with a flair for drama. According to Dr. Mercola's analysis, this organism produces some unusual phospholipids. To be more specific, these are molecular chimeras that contain a tiny environmental contaminant called diethanolamine, or DEA. DEA always sounded to me like a band name from the 80s, maybe a heavy metal group that left your ears ringing. But apparently, in your gut, DEA might leave your body inflamed. And not in the my pants don't fit sense, but in the my immune system is staging a rebellion sense. Yes, these DEA-laced phospholipids can activate immune cell receptors called TLR2 and TLR1. If that sounds like a pair of sci-fi robots to you, you're not alone. But it's not nearly as fun. When TLR2 and TLR1 get triggered, they release pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6. And that's one invitation to an inflammatory party we'd rather decline. Picture IL-6 as an extremely enthusiastic bouncer letting in all the rowdy troublemakers. That can translate into symptoms of major depressive disorder. The notion is that your immune system, once it's all riled up, can feed right into the mental gloom and doom. It's as if your gut said, we're going to produce some chemical chaos. And your mind replies, I guess I'll feel miserable today. The science suggests a link between chronic inflammation and depression. It's like your gut and your brain are having an ongoing conference call with an open mic, each complaining about the other. Gut dysbiosis leads to systemic inflammation. Your brain picks up the message and the cycle continues until someone hits mute. That's the gut-brain axis in a nutshell, or in a peanut shell if you prefer. It operates both ways. Either your gut can fire the first shots, dysbiosis, leaky gut, the works, and your brain responds with neuroinflammation and some seriously grumpy feelings. Or it can start with brain inflammation that sends signals to your gut, which responds with, oh, so you want a meltdown? I can do that too. Precisely. It's a two-way street. We've got the scenario in which your gut goes haywire first, stirring up the cytokines, messing with the blood-brain barrier, and eventually leading to depressed or anxious mood states. Then there's the other scenario, where your brain says, I'm on fire, send help, and your gut mishears that, as start a bonfire of your own. It's like the worst example of teamwork. One system malfunctions, and the other just leans in to make everything worse. In the midst of that, you've got mood shifts, you've got fatigue, you've got all the classic hallmarks of depression or anxiety. It's basically the bodily version of that relative who wants to fight with everyone at Thanksgiving dinner. I imagine the conversation in my gut going something like this. Hey, Morganella, want to incorporate some DEA and incite the immune system? And Morganella replies, don't mind if I do. Then your poor brain can't cope anymore and decides it's time to run all the negative headlines across your mental newsfeed. Let's not forget the leaky gut scenario. Dysbiosis can lead to increased intestinal permeability, letting harmful substances enter the bloodstream. Then the immune system rings the alarm bells, and once you've got a systemic inflammatory reaction going, your brain is stuck with the fallout. It's like a group of uninvited guests trashing the hotel lobby. And once that party starts, tryptophan metabolism shifts toward the canarinine pathway. That's right, your body takes the tryptophan that could have been used to produce serotonin, the feel-good chemical, and diverts it into making substances that can harm your brain cells. So not only are you not producing as much serotonin, but you're also spurring glutamate excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity always sounds like something you should avoid, right? Because you never hear, oh, I had the best excitotoxicity last night. It basically means your neurons get overstimulated to the point of damage, which is terrible news for mental health. Another not-so-lovely effect is that once your brain is inflamed, it may tweak the hypothalamic-pituitary-adrenal axis. That's the stress response system. It can pump out more cortisol, which can further stoke the inflammation. When it rains, it pours. That's the cyclical two-way street of gloom. Inflamed gut, inflamed brain, messed up hormones, more inflammation. We're basically describing a soap opera at the cellular level, and it's not a great one. But the good news is that you can change the script. You can decide to fix what's broken in your gut so your brain gets a new storyline. Dr. Mercola suggests some steps to make that happen. Step one, remove seed oils. Seed oils are apparently the villain in the background of many processed foods. They have a high linoleic acid content, which can disrupt mitochondrial function, 
When you sabotage your mitochondria, you sabotage your cell's ability to produce energy. That has a ripple effect through your entire gut environment. Yes, it's like trying to have a garden party while sprinklers are on full blast. Your intestinal cells are just trying to do their job. But when their energy production is out of whack, your gut flora doesn't stand a chance. Swapping out seed oils for things like butter, ghee, or tallow can make a real difference. It's an easy first step. Ditch the polyunsaturated troublemakers, or at least drastically cut them. Step two involves avoiding endocrine disruptors and electromagnetic fields, or EMFs. There's no single magic bullet to hide from all of modern technology. But Dr. Mercola stresses that plastics and certain household chemicals can interfere with hormones. And hormones, as we know, play a big role in how your cells function. Low cell energy equals a welcoming environment for dysbiosis. It's a shame you can't walk through the world in a bubble. Actually, scratch that. Bubbles are usually plastic. The point is, reducing exposure where you can is a big help. Small steps. It's about minimizing the daily assault on your mitochondria so they can do their job more efficiently. Step three is about optimizing carbohydrate intake. This is always a hot topic because diets love to demonize or glorify carbs. But Dr. Mercola suggests your body needs around 250 grams of carbohydrates daily for optimal cellular energy, especially if you're trying to restore your gut. To clarify, it's not a free pass to go donut crazy. The emphasis is on easily digestible carbs, particularly if your gut is compromised. Some people start with something very gentle like sipping dextrose water. That's basically a rescue remedy to tiptoe your gut into better function. Not a permanent diet plan, more like a short bridge to get your gut from inflamed misery to improved tolerance for real foods. And then, as you heal, you can gradually introduce other carb sources, whole fruits, cooked vegetables, white rice, that sort of thing. The idea is to avoid going from zero to 100 on the fiber scale. If you overload on fiber while your gut is still struggling, you might ramp up endotoxin release. That's basically stepping on your own toes and making the damage worse. So we're taking baby steps with the fiber. That's because we don't want the gut environment to freak out. I imagine it like a gentle yoga class for your digestive system. No reason to do advanced backbends on day one, especially if your gut has the flexibility of a rusty tin man. Exactly. Step four is the introduction of Ackermansia mucinifera. This beneficial bacterium is prized for reinforcing the gut barrier. The plan, though, is to do it wisely, after you've done about six months of removing seed oils. Because if you're still pumping in the dietary offenders that wreck your microbiome, no probiotic superhero is going to fix it. The notion is to create an environment where Ackermansia can thrive. That might mean investing in timed release or micro-encapsulated versions of the supplement so they actually reach your colon intact. Because dumping a bunch of beneficial bacteria into a hostile environment is like sending puppies into a lion's den. They'll need protective gear. Then there's the broader concept of gut restoration. Remove the villains first, then gently nourish the good guys, and finally seed your gut with beneficial microbes. It's a story arc that takes patience, but the payoff is improved mental well-being and physical vitality. This is why that gut-brain axis is so fascinating. It's not just about avoiding digestive trouble. It's about shaping your mood, your energy, your outlook on life. That's a big deal. When you think about it, you start to realize that gloominess or anxiety might have a bacterial culprit, or at least a bacterial accomplice. Yes, and for folks who wake up feeling down or anxious, it can be liberating to consider that the solution isn't strictly psychological. It could be a combined approach. Nourish the body, heal the gut, and watch the mental landscape shift. The concept is pretty empowering. Let's talk a bit more about depression and anxiety. You know, they're not trivial conditions. It's tough to muster up optimism when you're struggling every day. But if at least part of the trouble originates in the gut, that suggests a tangible avenue for improvement. That's good news. It's different from telling someone, cheer up. That's rarely helpful. But if you say, there might be a gut bacteria culprit fueling your blues, that's a clue leading to real changes. Cleaning up your diet, reducing toxins, methodically rebuilding your microbiome. Over time, that might help calm neuroinflammation and rebalance those chemical signals that shape mood. And like any health transformation, it's a journey. There's no overnight fix. But it's encouraging to know your system has built-in resilience. Your cells just need you to stop messing with their environment. They're like a rebellious teen who will happily turn model citizen once you remove the bad influences. And the bad influences can range from Morganella morganii pumping out those DEA-containing phospholipids, to the seed oils in your potato chips, to the daily chemical exposures in plastics and personal care products. Each factor adds to the load your cells have to handle. This might sound daunting, but I prefer to see it as a step-by-step -step project. Step one, pick a better cooking oil, like trading canola for butter. Step two, cut back on plastic containers. Step three, moderate your approach to carbs. Step four, reintroduce beneficial microbes when the time is right. Breaking it down is so much more approachable than trying to fix everything at once. Right. And the positive side is, once you improve gut health, you might notice benefits in your sleep, your concentration, 
and even how quickly you recover from physical stress. It's all connected. Because once you quell the internal fires, your body can allocate resources to normal daily tasks instead of firefighting. It's that quiet synergy that makes the gut-brain axis so crucial. And by focusing on gut health, you're really championing your brain's well-being too. The next time you're feeling moody, maybe it's your gut's cryptic way of saying, help me out here. I'm trying to do good, but I need some support. Perhaps that's a more compassionate way to see our bodies. Instead of feeling betrayed by them, we can realize they are doing the best they can with the environment we provide. If we feed them poorly and surround them with toxins, we're basically tying their hands. Exactly. And nobody wants to be tied up, especially at the cellular level. I'm personally intrigued by how quickly some individuals improve once they adopt these changes. For some, it might take longer. But the principle stands. Your gut is a prime influencer in your mental space. Well said. And I suspect Dr. Mercola's underlying message is that we have more control than we realize. We can choose better foods, steer clear of certain toxins, and rebuild a robust gut ecosystem. That's how we align ourselves with our innate cellular wisdom. It all comes down to synergy. Our trillions of gut microorganisms can be our allies or our saboteurs, depending on how we treat them. And that, in turn, shapes how our brains handle stress, mood, and overall outlook. On that note, we've reached the end of our journey for today. We touched on everything from Morganella Morgani's questionable party tricks to the practical steps for healing a leaky gut, all in the name of better mental health. If you're listening and thinking, I have some changes to make, that means you're tuned in to your body's real talk. Because your cells are definitely trying to reach you, and they're counting on you to pick up the phone. This has been Dr. Mercola Cellular Wisdom. I'm Ethan Foster, encouraging you to see your gut as the central command for a healthier mood. And I'm Alara Skye, reminding you that the best comedic material sometimes hides in your own microbes. Stay curious, stay healthy, and keep the conversation going inside and out. See you next time, folks. Thanks for watching. Subscribe now and click the notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.